We will stop again at six and reconvene tomorrow. There's no point saying we won't because we have 10 motions. So, um, Councillor Boyle, you are first up. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I've passed on a slight amendment uh, to Theresa, which I've put up um, and it'll be up there in red for members to consider. I think it makes sense. Um, it's simply just an additional uh, letter to Robert Jenrick, uh, MP, who's the Minister of State at the Home Office. Just, uh, just for the formalities, John, yeah, you need a can, you, can you propose your motion, get your motion uh, seconded, I, I, and then we will then... That's the, or, that's the order you want it in, so yep, obviously yep. I'll, I'll propose yep. that motion. Can yep. we take just it? Just for the formality. So motion proposed, motion seconded, amendment proposed, <laughs> amendment seconded. Right, yep. There we go. Go All ahead. Right. Happy now, Mayor. Okay, so Robert, Robert Jenrick, MP, he is the um, Minister of State at the Home Office who has a specific portfolio over immigration um, and he's had quite a lot to say in relation to this matter of late. Um, so, as I said, members, clearly we would want to take that as read on and, and it's about the electronic tra travel authorisation scheme, um, which is probably being widely debated at the minute as well. Um, I'm just wondering will we actually get through this debate without the B word being mentioned. I doubt it. Um, but clearly, the implications of the uh, ETA are the residents of the Republic of Ireland who are not Irish citizens will be required to possess an ETA to simply cross the border. And so put simply, that means that a Polish person, a German person, um, or indeed anybody from the European Union or anybody from the continent of Africa who lives in, or anywhere else in the world who lives in the Republic of Ireland, who wants to cross a border, simply, for example, to go shopping, and ASDA would require uh, an ETA to visit ASDA or a shop in Straban or something here in Derry, or indeed people uh, who want to travel back and forward um, for work purposes, education purposes, um, and of course, that then becomes even more complicated and all the more unwelcome. I think you'll all agree when we consider the potential effect that this would have um, on the tourism and, and business sectors um, here in the north. Uh, simply put, again, international visitors who arrive into the Republic of Ireland, for example, um, they would face an unnecessary element of red tape were this scheme uh, to be introduced. And I think it's simply ridiculous to believe uh, that all of those international visitors would be particularly interested in filling out forms for maybe what may be considered a one or two day um, trip uh, north of uh, the border. Um, as we all know, particularly something we witnessed over the last number of years, there have been some, there have been some significant economic benefits um, in, the, in the tourism sector here. Uh, we see coach loads arrive here day and daily, particularly through uh, the high season. Uh, and many of the people in those coaches would have to fill in uh, the forms in order to get uh, an ETA, and that ETA is going to cost money as well. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's a ridiculous situation, as I already said, and I think we have to understand as well that 70% of tourism visitors from America, from Europe, and the European Union countries in particular, uh, close to those closest to it, to us, currently travel to the north through the Republic of Ireland. So, you know, you can clearly see, Mayor, uh, that this is just a non-starter. I know it is, there's some subject of conversation around it going on at the minute, but it's important, I think, that we as a City and District Council write to the relevant people here, explain to them just how opposed we are uh, to um, uh, this imposition uh, being placed on people, because in practice, the ETA will complicate life for non-visa nationals resident in Ireland, and especially those whose everyday lives, as I said, span the border. People, very, very specifically, who live in Donegal, uh, would be impacted. Uh, the northwest of Ireland, as we all know, uh, lacks the, tra the uh, travel and transport infrastructure in general, uh, with the rest of uh, the Republic of Ireland, and specifically, as such, for many of those living in this region, Derry is their central social and economic hub. And actually, I would argue Derry City and Strabane is their uh, central social and economic hub for many aspects of their everyday life, uh, their movement across the border, and a very uh, often unavoidable, even when you know the end destination will be returning to the Republic of Ireland. It's a nonsense, quite frankly. It's a nonsense. 
Um, so mem members, I'm putting this in front of you today for consideration. Um, I'm hoping that I will be able to receive unanimous support in respect of this. Um, putting barriers in the way of visitors who wish to come here, whether for business or for pleasure, or indeed barriers in the way of people who are not Irish citizens, but who do want to travel back and forward into the north. Um, it's just such an unwelcome um, uh, development that I, I just don't think any of us would would or could or should stand over it. So again, Mayor, thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Boyle and um, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just uh, we'll support uh, Councillor Boyle's uh, motion. I mean, this is basically a knock-on effect from Brexit. The UK government seems to want to close off off its borders, you know, to all except the chosen ones. I mean, the ETA list will affect our tourists, and there's no doubt about it. It's going to affect people from the USA, Canada, Australia, and EAA countries. Uh, can I just refer to? Uh, Ben Roser from Queen's University wrote, uh, and I'll just keep it brief, if I may, it's about four or five pages. Uh, bear with us, barely I find it again. Put simply, the means that there are only exempt from the ETA for British, Irish and common citizens with the right of abode in the UK. There is no exemption for non-visa nationals, residents in Ireland, which is just what John said there earlier about coming across the border, even to shop in, in Asda. It's absolutely ludicrous. It is ludicrous. And I believe you have to pay for it. Would it be correct saying that, John? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a money-making racket as well by the UK government to squeeze more money out of people that can't afford it. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Councillor Doyle. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks for uh, Councillor Boyd for bringing this. I think this is a particularly poignant uh, motion given the mess that the uh, British government have made of uh, their own Brexit back by the DUP. Um, it, it's getting to a point now where I genuinely wonder if some of the Tory ministers could point to uh, Derry on a map because it's fairly obvious that anybody who had any knowledge of this place, not that they, we know they don't care anyway, uh, would know that this was would have a devastating impact uh, not just on the economy but on our social fabric as well um you know this is the uh, i think yeah legislative sabotage effectively is what what uh, john has has submitted to us here but this is just another stage in trying you know effectively to cut us off uh from the rest of uh, of this island and it's not going to be accepted uh, so ain't you have no problem at all supporting the motion Thank you. Um, Councillor McGowan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Let me on. Um, thanks, Councillor Boyle, for bringing this motion. Um, the ETA is a direct outworking of Brexit, and Brexit is a direct attack on the Good Friday Agreement. Now, there's parties sitting on here today that cheerleaded, including the DUP and people for profit, they cheerleaded for Brexit. Uh, and some of them even cheerleaded for a hard Brexit on this island. Now, the Good Friday Agreement, we all know, was about reducing borders in this island in terms of tourism, health, trade, education and many other things. We have bodies like Enter Trade Ireland and Tourism Ireland that have spent the last number of decades promoting this island as one single tourism destination. And as Councillor Boyle has said, this has now got complicated as a direct result of the ETA. Now, Brexit is solely about barriers and borders. And the Good Friday Agreement was about breaking them down. And the non-alignment has started. It has started now in tourism. Uh, there's many who would want to scrap the protocol. And that would mean non-alignment would continue in health and education and in many other areas. So, as Councillor Boyle uh, pointed out, we now have a scenario where if you've been living in Donegal for 20 years and you're an Italian national and you decide to come in for Halloween, you need a, you need an ETA. Uh, and to get an ETA, you need a passport. And over half of Europeans that travel to this island do not have a passport. So it's directly linked and making it more difficult to visit the north. John McGrillan, the CEO of Tourism NA, has said there's already been a 20% drop in tourists from the EU since Brexit. Now, I raised this issue 18 months ago because as a language school, it directly affects us. We've had groups now that can't come to Derry because some of the students don't have passports. And so when the edit is introduced, it will only get worse. 
The problem is we are on an island, the largest airport is Dublin Airport. It brings 33 million visitors a year. The two airports in Belfast on a good day bring a third of that. And they don't connect to Europe or international. So the majority of people coming, they spend their money on this island in tourism, fly into Dublin, and we're now expecting them. And from Europe, half of those don't have passports. We're now expecting them now to fill on these farms and come across the border. It's going to cost jobs. It's going to cost thousands of jobs in this in this part of the island if we don't do something about it. Uh, the only thing I would say, and it'll be interesting who votes in this today, but for the people who supported Brexit, it's a bit like setting your house on fire and then phoning the fire brigade. So we'll see how they, they vote today on this. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and it's the, it's the Councillor Boyle, if he could include a line in, this is a direct attack on the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was about cross-border working on tourism, on health and education. This now means that Tourism Ireland has to go and sell a show in Europe or abroad and say, by the way, if you're looking to go north, you need a passport and you need an ETA. It's making that twice as difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor um, McGowan. Um, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. And look, um, well, I think we all recognise that the common travel era has been an immense value and benefit to the people of the United Kingdom and the Republic over many, many years, you know, predating even the European Union. Um, and we believe that we should cherish it and do everything possible. Look, that we remove any travel friction between it regardless of our position uh, on Brexit. And, you know, we also understand that, you know, we believe that there, the, the, that we must not lose the fact that there will be no routine immigration controls either at the land border or indeed on journeys within the CTA as a whole. The reference the SDLP motion points to of entry or exit in or out of the state uh, in that context of ETA, I, we believe gives an inaccurate depiction of how the regime will work in practice. And you know, that's not to say, Madam Mayor, that we do have concerns um, surrounding the impact of the, the new ETA um, on tourism, or indeed those living in the Irish Republic who are not citizens of the jurisdiction. You know, we want to see no obstacle, um, you know, to the 70% of overseas travellers who visit Northern Ireland after arriving into Dublin or, uh, you know, even the local tour operators who um, provide a service um, a, a across Northern Ireland and the Republic. And, you know, Madam Mayor, these uh, these issues, you know, require practical solutions. We believe that is achievable. And, you know, the Home Office have committed to working with stakeholders to mitigate those concerns uh, that the ETA will inhibit uh, tourism. And, you know, our party has been very, very clear uh, and have been in debates uh, with the government, you know, in around an amendment to support the, the Nationality and Borders Bill at Westminster and, you know, to take a, an account that Northern Ireland is a unique geographic and economic position. And, you know, we would hope that that argument still goes on. And we would call on our MPs, uh, even those who don't um, take their seats in Westminster, to keep that argument up there. But look, at the end of the day, you know, we listened so much here um, and around the, the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, you know, for us and the DUP, exactly the same principle that in their view must apply to North South must also apply to East West if the provision of that agreement uh, is to be protected in full. And you cannot have one principle for a North South relationship, oh, including the your EPA, to close? Have, Yes, finishing up and have completely different set of principles for the East West relationship underpinned by, you know, by. The Good Friday Agreement, and look at the end of the day, Mayor, we will support the the the, the recommendation here because what we want to see in the common travel area is ease of access. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. And just a wee reminder: proposers of motions have three minutes, and everyone else is two. Um, Councillor Harkin. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Um... I mean, there there are certain certainly benefits to the common travel area, um, and uh, it, it helps people. Many people get back and forward across the border without without trouble, but not everybody, because as we know, uh, the the Good Friday Agreement didn't have a problem with the hard border for people of colour, um, uh, and that's become a, a greater and greater an issue because there's been campaigning 
uh, by organizations. And that really underpins, I think, uh, some of the problem here, uh, the racism uh, of uh, Stormont uh, that didn't have a problem with that and the racism of the main parties in the doll. Um, so yeah, we we want to see uh, a border that everybody who um, lives here can freely cross. Um, and where people who are uh, trying to visit here internationally uh, are are able to uh, you know visit uh, every corner of the island without getting ensnared and tangled up uh, with uh, uh, barriers and bureaucracy. Um, so we we should push back on that. And and this is why uh, the rally in Dublin at the weekend was very very important because the people that are marching are marching to say we don't want an island. Uh, where there's borders, where there's barriers, uh, and where we're telling people from other parts of the world they're not welcome to come here and live here, um, or even to visit, uh, and that we've got a problem with diversity. Uh, and so that's the that's the island that I want to see develop. And it is worrying right now that the that the kind of capitalism that uh, some people in the chamber promote uh, pro is developing more and more barriers for people. You look across the European Union, you look at the, the way the British government operates, all these big powers and big governments, uh, they want more and more uh, barriers. They want more and more ways of regulating uh, what people do. Uh, and they want to create an in and out and an us and them. Um, that's why we're for getting rid of partition in this island and establishing a socialist island. Um, and uh, I think that that is uh, uh, the most meaningful way to stand up to the type of racism and barriers that some uh, big governments want to impose on us now. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Um, Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Very briefly, uh, thank John uh, for the motion. And uh, I, I respect the right of every country to protect its borders. But sorry, GB, you've got this one wrong. It's as simple as that. Uh, Let's go, you know, take it back to the drawing board. Uh, this is not one that will work. Uh, and I suppose Councillor McGowan did refer there to parties who uh, uh, didn't support Brexit or did support uh, Brexit. Um, I suppose it's not that long ago that his own party were a uh, party who wanted to get out of the European Union, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Donnelly? Now, the chair, chair, first of all, uh, the, the terminology in this motion as a Republican is absolutely shocking. Nor, you know, terms like Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland used completely out of context. But unfortunately, uh, and Secretary of State, I think it's the British Secretary of State, unfortunately, that's what's creeping in, this normalisation of, of, of British rule. And what, what's aided greatly, that greatly has been the Belfast Agreement, what some people would call the Good Friday Agreement. Partition is the problem on this island, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. There's two separate separate states here, and one is run by Westminster. And no matter what people or how people try to dress it up, that was uh, aided by the Belfast Agreement which says that there will be no change in the constitutional status without the support of the majority of people within the, what they called Northern Ireland, six counties. Good, you know, it's, it's being said here, this is an attack on almost on, 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 on Good Friday. The reality that the only thing that the Good Friday Agreement did was copper fasten British rule and copper fasten partition. That's that's the reality, but, but what Brexit has done is Brexit has highlighted the absurdity of of the British border in Ireland, and that's why we find all these these problems here. So to me, the Good Friday Agreement has just been an update of 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 British rule in Ireland. It's it's it just you know it's it's another step in a, in, a, in a counter democratic process. Reality is, no matter what way you dress it up, it isn't working. Partition hasn't worked, and partition never will work. So as long as we have partition, then we're going to have these problems here, and all the problems that went before it, and, and further problems. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Um, no further speakers. So on that note, I'll go back to yourself to sum up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I do agree with um, Councillor McGowan. Uh, um, we probably could add on, if it were in any way useful, that it does run counter to the principles of the Good Friday Agreement, and that it would add and impact negatively on the hopes and aspirations of our people here um, as we all continue to strive to build a peaceful and prosperous future. I believe that's um, what the vast majority of people in our city and district council area want to see for themselves and for their families and for their children in particular. Um, just to finish up, as I already pointed out, this scheme affects those who are already resident in Ireland, um, and there are clear grounds for concern regarding an advertent non-compliance with the um, with the scheme, uh, either through ignorance uh, of the new rules or indeed forgetfulness. Uh, just for the benefit of everybody, these concerns were raised by um, the CAG in 2021, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Uh, in 2022, and members of the House of Lords as well, in 2022, the potential implications of non-compliance are particularly concerning given the Nationality and Border Act of the UK Government of 2022, uh, which has increased the maximum punishment to four years imprisonment for anybody who is, and I quote, required to have a valid ETA and knowingly arrives in the UK without one. The word knowingly is the key word in that sentence. Um, I suppose, in a sense, it's doing the heavy lifting um, because that act actually allows for the criminalising of long-term residents of the border region in particular, um, people who may well um, fall into inadvertent non-compliance. This is how absolutely and utterly ridiculous uh, this scheme would prove to be. It's unworkable, and I don't believe that anybody in this chamber should vote against uh, the motion here this afternoon on the basis of language that is used um, uh, in uh, the the motion itself. Um, the important element of this is that we are striking out an opposition against something which will disadvantage so so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. Um, over the, number, the coming number of years, particularly those who are visiting the country and those who are living in the country as well. So thank you, Mayor. And again, uh, I ask everyone to support the motion in front of them today. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. And um, just to comment, um, and Stephen will know this, we have had a number of meetings, one with the German ambassador and one with the Italian ambassador over the last week. Um, and particularly the German ambassador was particularly taken um, with the border region here and the impact that it's, that it's having. The amount he, he, in his head, there was hundreds of miles between Derry and Donegal, but when he actually seen it physically for himself or, or not seen it, um, he couldn't believe it. So absolutely. Um, I'm going to actually have a vote on this. Thank you, Mayor. This is on uh, Councillor Boyle's motion. Uh, Alderman Allen Bresland. For. Alderman Morris Devaney. For. Alderman Darren Guy. For. Alderman Hussey. Alderman Kerrigan. Alderman Kerrigan. Alderman McCready. For. Alderman McMorris. For. Alderman Thompson's apologies, Alderman Wark. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Raymond Barr. For. Councillor Boyle. John. Councillor Michaela Boyle. For. Councillor Carr. Councillor Cusack. Councillor Dobbins. For. Councillor Donnelly. Stain. Councillor Emmett Doyle. Councillor Alex Duffy. For. Councillor Sandra Duffy. For. Councillor Edwards. For. Councillor Farrell. Councillor Ferguson. For. Councillor Gallagher. Stan. Councillor Harkin. For. Councillor Heaney. For. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Kelly. For. Councillor Logue. Councillor Logue. For. 
Thank you, Councillor Logue. Uh, Councillor McGinley? For. Councillor McGowan? For. Councillor McGuire's absent. Councillor McHugh? For. Councillor McKinney? For. Councillor Minnie? For. Councillor Norris? Councillor O'Neill? For. Councillor Riley? Councillor Sinoy Barr? For. Councillor Tierney? For. Just check uh, Alderman Carrigan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I make that 34 for the motion, none against, and two abstentions. Thank you. Uh, motion passed. Uh, moving on to the next motion, um, Councillor Norris. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Seconder. Councillor Tierney, thank you. Uh, I'll take the motion as being read. Uh, I'm aware that this issue has been raised before Council many times and ENR, but to no avail. In August the 23rd, 2017, a flood hit, uh, causing serious damage to our local area and district. As you are all aware, the Muff Glen Forest Lower Bridge was washed away. Since then, there's been multiple calls for it to be reinstated or a new one sited in a different location. I'm aware there's been interactions between the Council and Forest Service many times. Uh, Wolf Glen is a 34 hectare site of mixed woodland, all of which straddles a valley alongside the Muff River. The forest provides a welcome retreat for the local residents of Eglinton and visitors from surrounding areas and further afield, which was probably accelerated by COVID, in which people were seeking out areas of natural beauty. It is also home to uh, red squirrels, which is an endangered species, and the Red Squirrel Society, which uh, works up around Muff Glen, who have been calling for this bridge to be reinstated many times. This should be a scenic four kilometre circular walk through the woods, passing a couple of waterfalls. But since it's been washed away, and this is the main issue, the public that the Jews of Glen cannot walk a full loop of the forest, therefore leading people out on the Eden Rare Road, which is a 60 mile per hour country road, which leads them down this road, having to walk back to their car, which will be parked on the car park. So what you have is you have young children, families, walking out on this road, where there'll be tractors, uh, cars coming down at 60 miles per hour. This is a high health and safety risk. If we were to look at the hierarchy of control and health and safety, we would immediately look at engineering controls, which would tell us to replace the bridge. People using Muff Glen, lives are being put at unnecessary risk due to this bridge not being here. As mentioned in my motion, I believe there's an opportunity for the Forest Service to engage with various other agencies, such as DFI, to look at placing a bridge with a dam. This could look at one solution to two problems. I believe if a bridge were sited further down from where it originally was, and if it was a dam, this would allow the public to cross the Muff River safely. And also if the Muff River was to increase on height, allow the water to be dammed back from coming into Eglinton. I believe that the Forest Service has an obligation to make Muff Glen safe to use. And I believe the Department of Infrastructure has an obligation to look for solution regarding the flooding. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Norris. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Norris, for bringing this forward. Um, Councillor Norris covered a lot of the, the history with Muff Glen and how it is an absolutely beautiful place. I love taking my own children there, and unfortunately, do have to just turn back because it is too unsafe to continue round onto the main road. So we have to turn back. And again, he's also highlighted the fact that a lot of community groups, a lot of local people have been campaigning for a number of years since 2017. Also, they've put investment by trying to save the red squirrels and try to build a safe place for them within the Glen itself. I think that this is one of these things that 
um, we've raised a number of times through many of our committees, and I know uh, previous councillor Mary Durkin was very active in this one too, that it's been left to us as council to pick up, basically for us to turn around and say that we were going to step in. And I think it's down to the departments, it is down to the forestry service, and it's time that they now commit, like councillor Norris has said, to repair the bridge, put in something that will help with the flood alleviation and the anxiety, and to give the forest back and the glen back to the community. Um, so we're happy to support the motion and thank Councillor Norris for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Norris, for, for his motion. Uh, Muff, Muff Glen is a valuable asset that people of Eglinton and wider field use on a regular basis. We as a council recognise the benefits to exercise and connecting with nature as to the people uh, for their physical and mental well-being. We should be encouraged and promoting these activities and doing whatever we can to ensure access to these assets are safe and accessible. It's encouraging that the former Deira Minister puts recognise the importance of Moff Glen, but unfortunately for us, he doesn't feel strongly enough about it to get back to work and deliver for the people of Eglinton and wider field. Uh, we fully support the motion and again thank Councillor Norris for highlighting this uh, for this vital project to be completed as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Um, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. And I think most of us are well aware of the issues in around the 2017 flooding and the issue in around uh, Muff Glen and the bridge being damaged and wrecked at that time. Look, we have no problem in supporting the um, the notice of motion coming forward here. We do believe that that you know the emphasis has to be on on the departments um, to leave good what was there uh, and make Muff Glen a, a safe place again. And uh, you know uh, uh, it's a lovely, it's a very very scenic area, so it is. And a lot of people would have walked that loop with the bridge there now. As the previous speakers did say, can't walk that loop and. Uh, they're diverted on to a, a very, very busy road. But happy to support the notice of motion, Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor, and thanks to Councillor Norris for bringing the motion forwards. Uh, people before profit are happy to support this motion. Um, Muff Glen is a beautiful um, asset that we have um, in the local community, um, but unfortunately the damage that the flood caused has, um, the, has been forgotten about uh, by the relevant authorities. And, you know, the, the, the health and safety issues walking along the road have been outlined. Um, and. It's, it's not a, a viable alternative to replacing the bridge. Uh, and I think it's it's important in any solution that is determined with regards to rebuilding the bridge and uh, reinstating the loop walk for Muff Glen, that the local community are involved, that the Red Squirrel Society, who are very active within Muff Glen, um, are involved. Um, and, you know, with regards to the dam bridge, you know, uh, obviously, if that is an option, the relevant environmental impact assessments would need to be done, um, given the ecosystems that exist in Muff Glen. Um, and, you know, when talking to local residents about uh, this motion coming forward, you know, they would also love to see picnic benches, uh, benches and things, you know, throughout Muff Glen, because it really is a, it's a beautiful forest walk and we don't have enough forest walks, unfortunately, um, in our council area. So, so it's something that we really should cherish and, and invest in. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Um, I don't have any further speakers, so back to yourself, Councillor Norris. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, fellow councillors, for all their comments. Uh, totally agree with uh, Councillor O'Neill and her last comments. Uh, this is a total health and safety issue, so it is. Uh, I go up there regularly with my dog and my uh, wife and children. And uh, you watch young children walking that road. It's amazing that nobody's been killed yet, you know. And unfortunately, somebody has to take responsibility. And that is, in my mind, the Forestry Commission and the Department of Infrastructure. Uh, I would say, uh, as Councillor Neil sort of touched on, picnic benches and all the rest. It would be perfect for forest school. It's perfect for a lot of things up there, you know, the link in the two schools and the free schools area in the area. And uh, 
I just think it needs sorted out. It's going on too long. This six years, if it was anywhere else, it would be built. And unfortunately, we're in a rural area and it's not being built. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Norris. Um, I think that's unanimous. I haven't seen anyone speak against it. So um, that motion is also passed. So thank you, Councillor Norris. Um, the next motion is in my name. And just to assure people, um, Philip is timekeeping. So I'm sure he will remind me if I go over. And Councillor McKinney is going to second the motion, but he also has a, a small amendment. So I bring him when I'm finally speaking, Councillor McKinney. Um, no, just wait, and then you can bring the amendment in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I am really honoured to be able to bring this motion forward. Um, as somebody who lives with a visual impairment um, and have been making you all aware of it over the course of the last nine months, certainly, um, I, I think that when I was approached by RNIB to bring forward a motion in relation to this, I, I, I was felt very privileged to be able to do it. Um, I think that it's really important that I help to raise awareness of the work that um, RNIB is doing within the city and particularly with the Dial Centre in the Northwest Regional College but also just to raise awareness of people who are living um, with blindness or a visual impairment across the city and district and, and some of the challenges that they might face. And not everybody would be fully aware of them. People often think of sight loss and think of either you can see or you can't see and not about the many different shades of vision in between. And I have a number of friends who also have visual impairments or are blind um, and not one of us have the same condition or the same level of sight. Um, I have a number of facts that I, that I want to just share with you in terms of some of the challenges, but just just from sitting looking at you um, today, the front row, just so you have a, an awareness, I can't see you from the nose up, and the back row, I can see your shapes, and that's about the height of it. So, And that is why when I ask people to indicate to speak, that they clearly indicate to speak, because if you don't, I'm not seeing you. Um, but I have some facts and figures that have been shared with me by RNAB, particularly in relation to the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. So I'm just going to um, read a few of these out. Um, so just from the report, the latest report that they have, they just want to highlight how tough it can be um, uh, in access and treatment and services. Um, and then, of course, a lack of emotional and practical support for people who are blind and partially sighted and uh, the challenges that they face. RNIB have their own vision for the world where blind and partially sighted people participate equally. And their purpose is to help people achieve that and to break down the barriers that people with sight loss um, often face. Um, let me just move on. So public attitudes towards sight loss are rooted in stereotypes and a lack of knowledge about blindness and partial sight. The majority of people in the general popul population would agree um, that blind and partially sighted people are not treated the same as everyone else. Despite legislation that aims to protect the rights of blind and partially sighted people, the accessibility of products, information and services is still not um, an area where people with sight loss have equality of experience. Whether this is being able to independently read and on grocery packaging, being able to enjoy favourite TV shows with audio description, or getting information from health services in accessible formats, blind and partially sighted people often experience a significant information and inclusion gap because of the visual impairments. Transport systems, pavements and built environments are often not designed to be fully inclusive of people with a visual impairment. People with sight loss are unable to drive, so for journeys they cannot be made by walking. They rely on public transport, taxis and lifts from friends. Um, navigating streets, public spaces and buildings can be challenging for people with sight loss, particularly if the built environment is unfamiliar. 
changeable or not designed in accessible ways. I have many a scraped knee and hand from falling. Um, no one should experience sight loss without the appropriate support. Despite advancements in clinical treatments over the last decade, less attention has been paid to the patient pathway as a whole um, from pre and post diagnosis. The support mechanisms within this, as a result, many individuals find themselves ill-equipped to live with their sight loss and the increased risk of poor well-being, low confidence and the impact that that has on a daily basis. Only 17% of people experiencing sight loss are offered emotional support in relation to their deteriorating vision. People with sight loss were often more than twice as likely to experience difficulties with unhappiness or depression. More than 40% of blind and partially sighted people feel moderately, moderately or completely cut off from people and things around them. Um, being told you're losing your sight can be one of the most difficult things to come to terms with, but common effects being depression and reduced well-being, with many people not able to receive essential support in relation to their sight. Having to relearn how to do everyday things is the reality of losing your sight. This can include everything from relearning how to make a cup of tea to moving safely around your local area. But provision of specialist rehabilitation service varies, and most people do not receive practical support with mobility or practical tasks such as preparing food. And I'm out of time, but I'm just going to make one more point. So in the, this council area, there are estimated to be 4,030 people currently living um, with some sort of visual impairment, and that's over and above your people who um, just are short-sighted or need glasses. So I will end it there, um, and I'm going to pass over to the seconder of the motion, um, Councillor McKinney. Thank you. Mayor, thank you very much, and thank you for what you just said there about uh, state loss and explained it to uh, all my colleagues here and online. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Rory McCartney from the RNIB, who sat in the gallery. Uh, very patiently waiting for this motion to come through. And thank you, Rory. Uh, before Christmas, uh, and I'll come on to my amendment in a minute, if I may. Madam Mayor, do you want me to put it up now? Put it up now. Uh, I'm just going to ask for my amendment to be put up, if you may, please, Theresa. Okay, basically, uh, this council uh, commits to work. Sorry, you, you need a seconder for your, for your amendment as well, Mr. Uh, yeah. Ferguson. Yeah. Okay. He pulls on and we we'll walk around the town and I find it a very frightening experience, to be quite honest. Uh, I then attended a, a further training session, which the mayor was at, and it was how not just uh, people that are, uh, people are visually impaired, we work always to make it look like, you know, what will happen when you start losing your sight where you have no peripheral vision, you have the black spots coming across your eyes, etc. And it was really fantastic. And in fact, just recently, to be honest with you, I watched a clip on uh, Facebook, and the question was, how does someone with sight loss stop a bus? Okay, and the answer was simple. London bus drivers are trained to stop if they spot someone with a white cane or a guide dog, and then tell the person their destination and direct them to a seat. I wonder how many Translink drivers are aware of this, or our hotel staff within the district, or our supermarket staff, you know? So I, I would urge everybody to, if you get the offer, to take up the train with RNIB. It is free, and it is really, really interesting, gives you an insight. I myself suffer from diabetes. And I really had told with my ex father in law every time I went to visit him in England, his screen was getting bigger and bigger on the TV. And he was end up using a magnifying glass to see. And the TV was about half the size that eventually covered the whole wall. So I understand, 
you know, what could have actually happened to myself because he had diabetes. So that's why I find it really essential and important that we should train and be able to help people with that and invite people to our city then and district. Make it an open one. I believe, Madam Mayor, maybe you can correct me on this, we are the first city in Northern Ireland and in the whole island to actually put this motion through. And I think I'm correct in saying that. And I think we need to lead the way and make it open to everybody. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Um, Councillor Dobbins. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thanks for bringing this motion forward. Having previously worked uh, for a number of years with RNAB as a support worker to a campaigns manager and to the eye care liaison officers in Alton and Gavin, um, I know exactly um, how this was, this really does hit home. Uh, I, would, I would like to say hello to Rory if uh, uh, it's been pointed out that he's there. Um, and Rory had the courage to, to come to us uh, with regard to doing the simulation specs ar around the town. And I've done it so many times uh, during my employment there that, um, yeah, I can tell you. And I, for one, now you may have a wee cataract and, and even cataracts, cataracts are scary, you know. So um, the blind and partially sighted people can live the lives they want to and lead the lives that they want to lead. But it's how others that behave uh, and what we think of it uh, can often get in the way. RNIB campaigns to change behaviours and perceptions, uh, as you rightly said, around sight loss uh, and encourage people to see the person, not the sight loss. Um, we, need to, we need to change society so that the blind and partially sighted people can, t can take part on an equal footing and face a world without barriers. And Mayor, as, as you know, um, there just before Christmas, we had uh, a wee set of twins come in from uh, Round Park area who were Paralympians, uh, a gold and bronze medal for triathlon. So, you know, what they can do, uh, and these were two wee slip of gears, like they were only 18 or 20 years of age, uh, and looking at them, you know, you, you just wondered how, uh, how can they do that? Uh, they were amazing. Um, when, when more of us understand the realities of sight loss and think about the part we can play in improving the world for people with sight loss, then we make this world a better place. And like this is the, the year that it is, the election year, um, even to go and vote. Um, if you're blind, you know, how can you do it? And there was a bill, an elections bill was passed in the mainland. And it hasn't come here. So, um, you need to keep your marks are closed. I will certainly. What my closure is, uh, once again, I am thanking you for bringing this forward to council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Boyle. Uh, thank you, Mayor and uh, Sinn Féin will be happy to support uh, Councillor McKinney's amendment also. Um, first of all, Mayor, thanks again for bringing this uh, very important uh, motion forward. Um, and I too would urge Council to commence work with RNIB and the other relevant partnerships going forward to make our city and district a visually aware space. Um, through whatever means of training and innovative solutions and ideas with civic institutions and local businesses. There still is a lot of work to be done in this area to raise awareness through the understanding of the experiences um, and needs of blind and partially sighted people. Uh, we need to do more to help inform the public, business, communities, civic societies, sports clubs, uh, uh, etc., and how they plan to address the needs of individuals with sight loss and partial sight loss to partake in all aspects of society and to help them lead independent and fulfilling lives. As you outlined, Mayor, understanding their needs is key. Information is key. For example, as you said, how we can, you know, uh, get information, obtain information on access to services, cares, 
transport, independent living, employment, education, and especially for our newcomers to our area, Mayor, which is very important. And for those who, who, who lose their sight suddenly, not being able to adjust to sight loss gradually and how they adjust and navigate their way around their community that they live in and indeed to get that information on how they can rehabilitate. I want to also say hello to Rory and I want to commend the work RNIB and all our voluntary statutory organisations do uh, to support blind and partially sighted people. And Mayor, like yourself, um, there are different aspects of sight loss. I have my own condition and I spoke at a recent event uh, for RNIB about my own experiences and how I'm preparing uh, my future with total sight loss, um, you know, further down the road. And I just want to say we, we talked about businesses and particularly supermarkets. When you go to, you know, a lot of supermarkets now don't have someone at the till and that self checkout. It's a pure disaster for someone with sight loss or visually impaired. There is no consideration given to people, um, you know, with visual impairments. Um, even, even Mayor, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, your own problem there, you know, when you're uh, in the chamber. Um, and, and I know all too well at times sitting in our very own chamber, you know, if you're light sensitive, you know, the, the bright light, the sensitivity around that, the, the effects that that can have on someone in, in, in a very bright room with very bright lights even, you know. So there's a lot to be considered, and I, I commend once again yourself, Mayor, for bringing forward um, the motion, and look forward to to um, the completion of the work and seeing the outcome of that um, for our city and district. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, Councillor Barr online. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a lot. I have a lot already lost or sight completely as an adult. Um, you know, Goes without saying, I'm absolutely delighted to see uh, you bringing this motion here today. Um, previous speakers have outlined there in great detail uh, the many challenges uh, blind and visually impaired people face every day. And I would be delighted to see our council playing uh, an active role in edu educating the, the people of our district on how to how to engage with people with uh, who are visually impaired. And even the shops, as, as uh, Michaela has just alluded to, um, getting the shops on board and helping them make even a shopping experience, uh, you know, a lot easier than it is now for people who are visually impaired. And I thank you again, Mayor, for bringing the, the motion. Thank you, um, Councillor Doyle. Thanks, Mayor, and, and thank you for for bringing forward the motion. Um, I, I was at the event that. Uh, Councillor McKinney refers to when we were walked from uh, the Dial Centre up through the city centre. Um, he describes it as frightening. It was terrifying. Um, not being able to see where you were going and having to you know rely on some of the the infrastructure in terms of uh, you know uh, the pavement and having to, to try and to navigate that um, and understanding how you, you know we need to change. Uh, urban planning to to try and uh, ensure that uh, people with uh, eyesight problems uh, are able to engage properly within the city and district. One of the things that, that one of the uh, the volunteers was talking to me about on that day was the problem that we have now with uh, you know the cafe culture that we're we're bringing into the city and district. Sa uh, you know sandwich boards in particular. Uh, you know the amount of times that uh, they themselves have walked into one and ended up falling right over them. Um, and you know those types of things need to be taken into consideration as well. So, you know, in terms of urban planning, in terms even of our own capital um, projects going forward, I think all of that should be taken into consideration. Uh, like other speakers, I want to welcome Rory and, and thank him for all the work that he and our NIB do. Um, and I would encourage, as Philip has said, as many members and staff as possible to go and do the training, um, because it, it, you know, for for want of a better term, it's, it's certainly an eye opener. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Neil. 
Thanks, Mayor, for uh, bringing this motion forward and just welcome Rory as well to the Chamber. And I just want to thank RNAB also for all the work that they do um, in supporting visually impaired people and also for raising awareness. Um, so, yeah, I also took part in the training as well and I thought it was excellent. And, you know, I think the more people that do this training, uh, the better assisted society um, we'll have with uh, more awareness. Um, on what it's like to live with a visual impairment. Um, I think, uh, like Mary, you talked about the real life impacts for people with a visual impairment. Um, and, you know, in my other work uh, as a physio, like I've seen and worked with uh, people who have experienced new visual impairments and the isolation that that can cause, you know, within their own homes and uh, within their own communities. And, you know, there's not enough support within society. Um, I, I've worked with RNAB and enabling people, but even, you know, uh, people who work in healthcare don't have training to work with people who have visual impairments. Uh, you know, we people who maybe do time planning probably don't have training around how to design um, uh, spaces and places for people with visual impairments. So it's really, really important uh, that uh, more and more people are trained. And at the end of the day, it's society which disables people. It's not people's disabilities. Um, and, you know, one, uh, one uh, campaign uh, that uh, was active uh, for a number of years was the Smart Pass Equality Campaign um, because people with visual impairments, um, unlike people with visual impairments in England, Scotland, Wales, have to pay a half fare here for their public transport. So not only is our public transport not good enough, um, we know it doesn't actually enable access in a lot of cases, uh, but uh, people have to pay um, for their public transport here who have a visual impairment, and it's really not good enough. You know, DFA had an opportunity to actually change change the legislation there and provide that uh, public transport for free. And what they've done is they've continued to disable uh, people from actually participating in society when they can't actually, you know, you know, when they can't actually drive or um, own a car in a way. So, uh, you know, I think a lot more needs to be done. People for profit fully support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Um, Alderman McMorris. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing forward this very worthwhile motion. We also recognise the expertise of Royal National Institute for the Blind and appreciate the work that they have done to make us more inclusive, visually aware society and environment for the blind and partially sighted. We as a council should always be fully committed to making the city and district a visually aware space and therefore should fully support the work that council can do in partnership with both RNIB and the Northwest Regional College. Um, just ironically, on the on the, the interval there, um, a constituent had come into me, and basically that was one of the issues he had raised about his mother, who has physical disabilities, but also um, is totally blind. And, and I was just um, interacting with him, and 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 he was mentioning about the difficulties they had. Um, also, you know, it's very important that we kind of raise awareness within the city and district in order to increase employment up opportunities and also social opportunities for people um, partially sighted and uh, blind. So and I know that our NIB has done wonderful work and, you know, yes, I believe that we should all be doing the training to make us more aware of this issue. But, you know, we need to go further, you know, and I, and I hope that Council can help in, in order to achieve um, further goals in regard to this area. But our party will be supporting this motion. Um, Mayor, and uh, we're delighted it's been brought forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McMorris. Um, don't see any further speakers on the issue, so I refer back to myself to sum up. Um, it was really remiss of me, Roy, to not thank you and welcome you um, to today's meeting. And I really appreciate all the information that you have sent me in terms of the stats and research that um, RNIB has been doing, um, particularly here in the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. Um, just some commentary. I'm really pleased that uh, uh, this motion seems to be going to pass unanimously, but some of the, the commentary around it has been really welcome. And, and just to know that there's other people in that understanding, um, we should definitely become um, a visually aware city. We need to be breaking down those barriers and we need to have a greater understanding of people who are living with sight loss. Um, my own is a degenerative um, 
disorder. So we we'll see where it goes. Um, but just to comment on, on some of the things that were said, um, Michaela, just in terms of checkouts, yeah, absolutely, the most frustrating thing in the world. Also, going into a, a restaurant or a takeaway and the menu is on a board somewhere that you just can't see. Um, and <laughs> smart passes, yeah, I got one when I was first registered, probably about mm, almost 20 years ago, don't like to admit that, um, and stopped using it because not only was it only half fare, you had you could only buy a single ticket, you couldn't buy a return, you couldn't buy a weekly ticket, um, and it actually cost you more. So it, ju it just made absolutely no sense. But um, thankfully, I know, Rory, there has been progress on the motion before it's even been passed in terms of Council's Access and Inclusion Officer, I believe, met with yourself or other RNIB people um, earlier this week. So it's good to know that we are starting that journey. And I just want to again commend the work of RNIB and, and what they're doing and support that they have given me in, in the past, um, particularly when I my eyesight started to really deteriorate. Um, but anybody who hasn't done the training, I would encourage them to do so. And I would encourage them to take a trip down to the Dial Centre um, at the Northwest Regional College. It's really useful. Um, the work that they do is fantastic. So on that note, I will stop talking. And I <laughs> I didn't realise I talked that much. Uh, <laughs> Um, but on that note, I, I'll say that the motion was passed unanimously. So thank you, everybody, for amendment and, motion. amendment and motion. Yes, yes. We'll just take them both together. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Roy. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next motion, which is yourself, Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Aunt Marion. Will your permission? I'll take the motion as read, please. Chat box. Chat box. All right, thank you, um, Madam Mayor, and thanks to Councillor Raymond Barr for seconding this motion. Mayor, I bring this motion after the Commissioner for Children and Young People published a report under the care given to a young lady known as Vicky by the Western Trust. The report is titled A Formal Investigation into the Life of a Child in the Care of the State, which I've sent to all members in advance of this motion coming before Council. <coughs> Pardon me. I should point out, Mayor, that Vicky is not the, lady, the young lady's real name. The Commissioner's report found that there were systematic failings in her case since she was a little girl. The Western Trust is the girl's legal parent. However, Vicky is currently placed in a medium secure hospital in England. And it's from this secure hospital that Vicky wrote herself the opening pages of the report. Vicky, who is now 21 years old, has been, in the, has been in the care system since she was 10 months old. And, her, and her, in her own words, she has described her experience of a life in the care system. I have had a lot of social workers. Some of them scared me by telling me that I was going to be taken away from my mum. But I had some very nice social workers who played with me and took me to the swings and showed that they cared about me. Now on. I know that you are going to read about my life in this report, but all I want you to know is that I want to go home to Northern Ireland and live close to my mum because my family are really important to me. Mayor, there are many recommendations contained within this report, and each and every one of them is of equal importance as the other. However, in the motion, I have singled out three. The reason for that is because the three that I've singled out are about Vicky in particular and how the agencies with responsibility for her care can facilitate a return home. 
these three recommendations talk specifically about how the Western Trust can support her in preparation during and after the process of returning home. And I feel if these recommendations are implemented in full and in the proper caring manner, which they should be, it would give Vicky and her family some reassurance that all involved in her care have learned some lessons from the outcome of this report. Mayor, reading the report and Vicky's comments within it, I think members will agree that her experience in the care system has been heartbreaking. I don't know if there are any other children or families out there going through similar situations to Vicky. But what I do know is that I don't want any other child or family coming behind Vicky and having a similar experience. For that reason, Mayor, I'm asking members to support this motion today, which I hope will ensure that all of the recommendations within the report are implemented in full and in a timely, and in a timely manner. And that way, I hope it will go some way to ensure that there are no more Vicky's stories to tell. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Um, Councillor Raymond Barr on nine. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Tierney, for bringing this motion. Anybody that's read Nicky's report under this tragic story must be horrified and concerned at, at his findings. This child was failed at every level, and it hadn't, hadn't, if it hadn't been for the care and support of Vicky's foster family, her real family, God knows what situation this uh, young woman will be in now. The care Vicky received from her real family contrasted with the care she received from her legal parent, her legal parent the Health and Social Care Trust, who, who along with other uh, agencies, were guilty of a neglect of duty uh, to, to this child. As the report outlines, the Western Health and Social Care Trust must develop bespoke care and uh, living arrangements for her and provide adequate support. And it doesn't stop there. There's all our children at this moment in time from our council district, children and young adults who are separated from their families in situations which are causing severe emotional and financial stress to families who feel unsupported and helpless at the lack of facilities in the Northwest for children and young adults who suffer with mental health problems. I hope Vicky's case will be the catalyst for major improvements in the provision of proper mental health care for children and young adults in our council area. That support's not there at the moment, with parents having to make daily trips to Belfast, places like Down Patrick, to visit their children. I was one of those parents not so long ago, and I can empathise with what these families are going through. This foster family went through years of hell, as did Vicky herself, and as Councillor Tierney says, it must not be allowed to happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to Councillor Tierney for bringing this motion forward. Mayor, I sat and read through Vicky's report as a parent, thinking I could pull a few things out to talk about. And Mayor, I was gobsmacked. Um, as a mother, I was horrified. I know Councillor Tierney has highlighted a number of recommendations here, and, and there's 45 in the paper. You know, the... the even the voice of Vicky within the report asking why was she taken under care? What were her parents like when she was young? When can she go home? You can hear this girl has been ignored for far too long. She was failed before she was born. There was no pre-assessment and birth. She was then failed after. There was no post-assessment. Everything has been reactionary and not proactive. Her family, her mother has tried and had no support. There's been an absence of adequate preparation, a development plan for anything to do with Vicky's life. The departments have been living in silos. And Mayor, we see that all the time. This was a corporate parent failed this child. Now Mayor, I have a slight amendment because I just was working alongside Councillor Barr and our um, youth officer within council and we wanted to try and tie this in and how we as a statutory body also could take learnings from this. So our slight amount was just to add and for us as a corporate body to learn as well. And it was just basically that the council commits to train at least 70% of all elected members in the introduction to child's rights and practice to ensure members consider the rights of the child in every future decision they make. 
this is harrowing what happened to Vicky and I agree it should be around about her story and getting her home but I just wanted not just us asking other statutory bodies to do better but we can learn and do better too so uh, I hope Councillor Tierney doesn't mind me adding that on and hopefully it'll be supported but we're happy to support the motion. Thank you. Have you a seconder just for that? Yeah, Councillor McKinley. Thank you. Um, Councillor Makila Boyle, are you happy to speak on this and the amendment? Yes, Mayor. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mayor, um, Sinn Féin will be supporting the motion and the amendment. Um, first of all, Mayor, I want to pay tribute to Vicky's uh, foster family and her foster mum for the love and support that they have provided uh, to Vicky, um, for giving her a voice and making her voice heard and their persistence while the corporate par parent failed. Um, under the most challenge of the circumstances, I know the family have done this. Um, I know they fought so hard throughout Vicky's life to get her the proper support in place and the protection of her rights. And for the most part, that fell on deaf ears. The most glaring, um, I read the NICE report and it's a very disturbing read and I have read it in full. And I, anyone who hasn't read it, I would urge them to read it. The most glaring uh, observation for me in the report is the opening comments from the Children's Commissioner, uh, Kula Yusuma, and what lessons need to be learned is the failure of children and young people's social work system here in the North, and in Vicky's case, how it valued process over substance, and how it failed significantly to protect the rights of the child and promote the interest of its service users and carers. A system which endeavoured to tick boxes in the most perfunctionary way without seeking to understand the impact of its actions and inactions on the child. That demonstrated by trying to focus on compliance with regulations and rules. And we have reduced social work profession to a series of administrative tasks, removing professional initiative and judgment. And the consequence of that indeed is profound bearing on Vicky's case. The Commissioner's Office Mayor used their strongest powers to examine all the records concerning the child and now a young woman who had been in the care of the state service since she was a few months old. She is now 21 and has been deprived of her liberty, liberty for the last six years, four and a half of them in a medium secure facility in England. The report found 29 adverse findings against four relevant authorities here. Uh, the Western Health and Social Care Trust um, being, you know, as her legal corporate parent, bear the vast majority of the adverse findings and recommendations within the report. The report found that they consistently fail to discharge their legal and moral duty to this young woman from the day she was a baby to this very day. Mayor, um, I, I, I know the family and I know that they have long term future plans to bring their daughter home to suitable accommodation. And I would urge everyone possible involved in this case to ensure that that happens, to ensure that suitable accommodation is sought and the wraparound services that are provided that, that Nikki needs. Um, as the proposer of the motion said, we also, there's an onus on us to ensure that all 45 recommendations uh, are implemented as soon as possible, that no other family and no other child goes through their life um, like this, that don't get the care that they need while the corporate parent is, you know, the one that should be trusted to care for. I need you to bring your remarks to close. That should be trusted to care for a child in their care. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you to the proposer of the motion also. Thank you. Um, Alderman Devaney, are you happy to speak to both? Yes, very content, Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor, for allowing me in. Uh, and look, uh, I welcome the notice of motion coming forward here. Uh, and no problem in supporting the recommendation recommendation here. And I think when anyone will listen to the previous speakers, that we all hear the stories and around Vicky uh, and the feelings um, that have happened to her. This was allowed to happen, and I think uh, I'm not going to go over everything that has been mentioned before, Mayor, but I believe that uh, we do need to, these recommendations put in place to ensure that this doesn't happen again, uh, and, you know, in a timely fashion. I look very supportive of well, 
uh, uh, you know, making sure that this daughter is returned to her family um, as soon as possible. But happy to support the notice of motion on the amendment, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Neil on both? Yeah. Yes, on both. Um, yeah, people before profit are happy to support the, the motion and the amendment. I'd actually um, highlighted the same things as Councillor Michaela Boyle uh, from the report around the what the uh, Children's Commissioner had said around social workers um, choosing process over substance and compliance with process rather than using professional initiative and judgment. And I think, um, you know, this is another symptom of the crisis that's in our health and social care system. Um, declaration of interest as a, a employee of the Western Health and Social Care Trust, but you know, social care is um, underfunded and is, is on its knees. And um, you know, there is that lack of support, and for for families and for for children in need like this, it's actually really hard to get support. Um, like the system is so hard to navigate. It's so hard to tick the right boxes in a way to get the support that you need. Um, and this is this is why this report is so welcome. It's so important that we hear this real life story, um, so that you know. Uh, improvements can be made, lessons can be learned, um, and we can actually improve the lives of children and young people here. Um, so I'm happy to support the motion. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Doyle on both. Yep, thanks, Mayor. Um, really appreciate that uh, Councillor Tierney's brought this forward, and I particularly welcome the, the last paragraph there around requesting a timeline, because um, like I'm sure other members, I've had to deal with some cases that involved social services on behalf of constituents over the uh, the, the period of, of being here. And I think it was Councillor Michaela Boyle mentioned, you know, but taking away professional judgment and turning social workers into pen pushers, which is what they never wanted to have to do. Um, but certainly, even the experience that I've had in terms of cases with the Western Trust have been absolutely harrowing. Um, and I don't, for the life of me, understand um, how cases like Vicky's and many, many others get to the stage where um, you know agencies like this council and the Children's Commissioner um, have to step in. There are serious concerns to anybody, really, that I speak to that have experience of engaging with the trust and social services um, around how they manage uh, risk but also how they actually engage with people uh, in terms of not listening to concerns um, and basically putting the needs of the trust above the needs of uh, children and young people. So Andrew's more than happy to support the motion and thanks to Ryan for bringing it. Thank you. And finally, Alderman Guy online. I'm happy to speak to both. Alderman Guy. Nope, I think we've lost him. Um, I'll go to Councillor Edwards. Hello, Mayor. Ah, uh, just in time, Alderman Guy, go ahead. All right, sorry, I couldn't get the uh, couldn't get the button there. Um, yes, uh, and also Union's party happy to support both. Um, and thanks to Councillor Tierney for bringing forward this motion. Um, listen, I agree with what a lot of people have said. I agree totally with what Councillor O'Neill has said as well. Um, you know. And we, we hear of all the horror stories, and this is another horror story that has gone through the system as well. And we keep saying, you know, these it needs fixed, it needs fixed, but it never seemed to be fixed quick enough. Um, I have to, I have to uh, declare an interest here because my daughter is a social worker uh, and she still lives at home with me. Uh, she's been a social worker for a year now, and, you know, they don't get it easy. You know, and I'm not I'm not sticking up for also I know they're they're the they're the worst people in the world they can be. A lot of people say, Oh, I don't like dealing with them social workers. They don't find they don't get it easy. My daughter has 14 cases on her books at any one time. She's been a social worker for a year. Now she's not she doesn't work in this trust. But I know there's people in all our trusts that are have less cases on the books. In fact, less than half of that on the books at any one time. And maybe that's the right way to go, who knows? But the pressures that's being put on uh, these social workers by those above is absolutely disgusting, to be honest. They, they, they can't get enough workers through the door. 
they basically look after these children. They try their hardest. And I have to listen to some harrowing stories to you. And, and, you know, it's the actual, the social workers themselves, their mental health, they, they, they face burnout after a few years, as many people will know. Um, they would rather be doing the work just as our nurses and hospitals would rather be doing the work that they were trained to do and not have to fill on endless uh, uh, paperwork and uh, red tape and so on. But listen, I just want to say that support us here, support the motion, um, but let's not forget that the social workers are human as well. So uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Edwards. Mayor, thanks for letting me in on this. And I do want to thank Councillor Tierney um, for bringing this motion, Mayor. Mayor, my own parents foster um, two young children. Um, and those kids are lucky to have uh, a loving, um, caring home. They have them for five years now. Uh, a loving, uh, caring home um, with all the support they need and they're excelling in school and so on. They came from um, severe disadvantage um, and they're doing very well and it's great to see. But Mayor, there's also um, children out there who <clears throat> aren't fortunate enough to get a love and care and home in, in the foster and adoption system. Um, children who are um, institutionalised into residential care um, long term, which which isn't good for anybody. And I'm also, like Councillor Boyd, I'm also um, aware of this case, albeit from um, Councillor uh, Tierney. Um, it's absolutely harrowing. Um, the, the report outlines massive failures. And I, I do understand that you know, social care like healthcare um, is under extreme pressures. But um, when reports like this come out, they, they need to be um, followed up on, and recommendations need to be need to be passed on them, Mayor. But I just wanted to, to add that sort of personal touch in there, and how important it is that that these young children have support, loving um, families, um, growing up, and have that support network around them. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um... Councillor Jackson, and then I will bring in Councillor Boyle for a, a, a point of clarification. Go ahead, Councillor Jackson. I'm going to just try a quick point. The, uh, I know Councillor Boyle has give, indicated that we fully support the motion. I just, in the interest of openness, they declare an interest as an employee in the trust. Thank you. Councillor Boyle, um, quick. Yeah, a quick clarification. clarification. Uh, just, 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 Mayor, I thought it was important because we're in public session. Uh, just, it's important to note that the feelings um, just are not the respons responsibility of individual workers, but were systemic around the corporate trust and the recommendations, um, you know, uh, are, are, are around the systemic changes, you know, and the changes that need to happen around corporately. And it's not attributed. To any individual workers, just to, you know, just to clarify that. Okay, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Boyle. And I suppose I may um, declare an interest that my husband's a social worker. Um, no further speakers. So we we'll go back to you, um, Councillor Tina, to sum up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And can I thank um, everyone who spoke um, on the motion? Um, it sounds as if it's going to. So, Sorry. just before you sum up the amendment, could I assume that everybody's in support of the amendment? Yeah. So we'll take that as passed and then go ahead and sum up. Thank you. Um, it sounds as if this motion um, and the amendment is going to pass uh, with unanimous support in this council, um, which is something that I think um, is positive coming out of the back of the report. Um, I understand and support the sentiments around the amendment. Um, and you know, if we're asking others um, to to bear in mind the, the the rights and the thoughts of children, then um, as a corporate body, we should be doing the same. Councillor Barr um, mentioned in, in his note, has speaking notes um, around the a neglect of duty, and that's exactly um, what this is. Um, Councillor Michaela Boyle um, talked there now about you know not being the fault of any individual social worker um, and I think that's right I don't think it's it's right to, to hang this case um, around one particular individual or one particular um, band of, of workers 
um, the, the failings here, um, and it's been very clearly detailed within the report, um, are, the are the fault of the corporate parent, and that is um, the Western Trust. And as a corporate body, um, they need to take responsibility for that. They have apologised um, for the failings um, identified within the report, um, which is welcome, and it's now time that they take steps, I believe, in a timely manner. Um, to implement all of the, the recommendations. Councillor Doyle mentioned around the, the the fact that the last paragraph um, had, the, had the word timeline on there. That was put on for a specific reason, um, and that was to make sure um, that we know exactly and that we can keep um, on top of this um, as, as we receive that timeline. Um, Mayor, there's 45 recommendations um, within this report. Each and every one of them, in my opinion, show a failure um, to this child and her family um, right throughout her entire life, and it is appalling. Family, um, as others um, have touched on, have fought for years to get Vicky the help um, that she needed. Um, and I believe that without the, the fight that the family had to put on, um, this report would not have seen would not have seen the light of day. Um, I certainly um, commend the family um, for all of the, the battles that they have been through um, over this last um, number of years to try and make sure uh, that Vicky's getting um, the care that she needs. And hopefully um, this council can support them and individual members can support them um, in, in that fight, because I know that this notice of motion today is not um, and will not be the end. The man Guy spoke about social workers and Councillor said... Tierney, you're going to have to bring your closer remarks. This is my last part. Councillor Guy talked about social workers and the fact that they, that they don't get it easy. And I know that and I understand that. Um, and, you know, <coughs> I, I've already touched on that. He also said that people were under extreme pressure. The report, in my opinion, points out that the person and the people that were under extreme pressure throughout this case was Vicky and her parents. And I think it's very welcome that this council is going to unite today to show our support to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's unanimous as well. Mr. Cheney, thank you. Um, I'm going to take the, the next motion um, as well. So, um, Councillor Sonoy Barr, you online? I'm here, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Just need a seconder for your motion. Councillor Tierney, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. As elected representatives, setting a budget is core to our responsibilities and our duty as councillors. I am sure I can speak for everyone in the chamber when I say that we all want the impact of those budgets to be fair for everyone in our community, regardless of gender. Yet the truth is, far too often, that is not the case. As we all know, Men and women can experience society very differently and have unequal access to local services, resources, and opportunities. I can give several examples, but I will highlight one of this one that this council is currently trying to address in Brook Park, where female members have no access to appropriate changing facilities. Mayor, several studies have shown time and time again that women are disproportionately hit by the British government's austerity policies. Failure to take this wider context into account when forming policy or making budgetary decisions risks increasing gender inequality and, quite frankly, does a disservice to our constituents. As a feminist and someone who has dedicated my life in um, advocating for women and girls' rights, and with International Women's Day just around the corner, this motion is an opportunity for this council to send a strong message on gender equality and lead the way on gender responsive budgets. The SDLP is joining other voices within our community calling for budgeting to be gender responsive, to actually take into consideration the different gender impact of spending on men and women. The North of Ireland Women's Budget Group in particular has been clear that only by truly embedding gender responsive budgeting can we accurately assess the impact of budgets on gender equality and take those learnings to allocate resources in a way that is more inclusive. As the motion notes, Mayor, the North of Ireland lags significantly behind areas of Great Britain and other organizations for economic cooperation and development countries in terms of implementing gender responsive budget practices. This is a cause of concern. 
uh, particularly since research has shown that countries with higher levels of gender equality are often associated with levels with lower levels of conflict across society. While there is some equality provision uh, offered under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, this is often viewed as a tick box exercise. This motion includes concrete actions that council can take to actively progress gender responsive budgeting within our own city and district and hopefully act as a template for other council across the north. Let me make one last point. This is not an ask for a separate budget for women or budgets which spend the same amount on women and men, but budgets that recognize the different needs of women and men and aim to promote equality in women's social and economic development. I therefore hope all parties here will back this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to uh, Councillor Siena Barr for bringing this motion forward, Mayor. Um, Mayor, a gender responsive budget is a budget that works for everyone. It's essential for both gender justice and for fiscal justice. And all that does, Mayor, is it analyses the budget that we use and the policies and their effects on different genders. And Mayor, I'll bring it back to kind of examples. We see across men's health and women's health, we see disparities. We see that a lot of things are based off testing with men and given to women and are expected to have the same um, side effects, which they don't. We, we see it in the rise in ADHD diagnosis of women in their 30s at the moment, because the standard practice is that the, the, the side effects or the, the, the signs that people show are what the little boys would show where they're overexcited, where girls do a lot of masking. And there, in, in our own example, in our own council, for example, anti-poverty programs in Mexico show that there were health and education and nutritional programs, but which relied heavily on the unpaid work of local women where they felt, the woman, the local woman felt that the level of investment that they had to put in outweighed the positive outcomes. So a bit like our COVID response, where we relied heavily on volunteers within our rural areas, which sometimes came down to people who weren't working or people who didn't have, oh, so there is a gender balance as in we figure out how that impacts on a certain gender. That's why gender responsive budgets is something that we should look at piloting here within our council to make sure that like our rural reality, a bit like our deprivation, to make sure any policy that we do doesn't impact negatively upon one gender over the other and create gender equality and equity across the council. So we're more than happy to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I'll be very brief, uh, Mayor, because I think everything has been said. Uh, gender responsive budgeting um, uh, is not a budget that, that aims to uh, work for one gender, but it certainly is to ensure everyone is treated equally. And uh, more research needs to be done, and it needn't be uh, just a tick back e exercise. Um, real uh, policies have to be brought in um, to ensure that uh, this gender responsive uh, budgeting um, is, is in place. And we will lobby or everybody in uh, local government, central government, to ensure that the implementation of, of policies and the sharing of best practice, practice uh, pol policies is, is carried out. And also, I'd like to say that the capacity uh, building is a, is a big part of um, ensuring that gender responsive budgeting uh, is, policies are in place. So I would encourage a, a more um, capacity building too uh, within our civic society, uh, community groups, etc. Uh, it could be taken on board too as well. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Logue, um, Councillor O'Neill. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, People Before Profit are happy to support this motion. Um, you know, we uh, support the concept of gender responsive budgeting uh, whilst understanding its limitations. Um, you know, women 
carry out the majority of unrec of uh, care work, which often goes unrecognised uh, within the capitalist system. Uh, and this is care work, which is either unpaid or underpaid. Uh, women make up the majority of that workforce. And, you know, the, with gender um, responsive uh, budgeting, it has the potential to capture that, um, that level of work. Um, however, the limitations are, I, I think it can increase awareness of the gender inequalities that exist and it can give recommendations. But in terms of having teeth to actually influence decision making, um, I think that would be good to look and see how that can be done within this uh, policy and within this motion. I suppose one example of that was there was um, uh, uh, analysis on how the welfare reform would impact children's rights in the same way it would, uh, this would look at how this would impact on gendered uh, rights. Uh, and unfortunately, the... All right, Councillor Neil. Is it very noisy? I, I, it's coming from here. I don't know who's talking, but go ahead, concern me. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, I was just explaining there was a children's rights analysis on welfare reform, which showed how disastrous welfare reform would be on the well-being of children. Uh, and you know that was clear within government policy, yet they implemented it anyway. So I think. Um, for this to uh, be meaningful, I think it's important that these recommendations are acknowledged uh, when it looks at the impact of women, because obviously when women's uh, rights are improved uh, within society, then it lifts all of society up. Um, and, you know, yeah, so I think uh, within her capitalist system, which exploits labour and undervalues care work, I think it's difficult to see the, the full out workings of this. I think this would be great in a socialist society. Um, but, you know, we're happy to support this motion and the and the crux behind it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Alderman McMorris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just want to say the DUP acknowledges uh, that the aim of this motion is to raise awareness of the effects that budgets have on women and men. We share the desire to create the social and economic conditions where everyone has the ability to maximise their potential, can enter education or the labour market and benefit from public spending irrespective of gender, age or socio-economic uh, background. In responding to the motion before us, we need to assess whether focusing on gender issues predominantly through the budget may detract from the need to ensure that those issues are addressed and integrated into specific policies. The DUP recognised the need to tackle gender inequalities as part of the new and ambitious skills published by the Minister for the Economy as part of Five Point, which was the was to the fore of our Assembly election ca campaign last year. They also pledged to deliver 30 hours uh, free childcare per week and overhaul social care. These policies will be key to addressing structural barriers to women assessing work or public and civic life. It remains a case of the greatest results towards ending gender inequalities and ensuring a fair use of public money will be secured by a move to a multi-year budget cycle and ending the reliance on a culture of an in-year monitoring rounds. Everyone in Northern Ireland stands to benefit from this. We have also previously argued that the budget process should start between April to June for the next financial year, with a draft budget being consulted upon in the autumn allowing full debate at the turn of the year. This would afford greater detailed scrutiny in advance. Therefore, council approach to these issues must not be treated in isolation from former um, wider developments in the executive and assembly. So when it comes to this ag aggregating data by gender, council would also need to be mindful of its wider Section 75 obligations in terms of equality uh, monitoring. By gender as a key consideration, we cannot have a blanket focus to the detriment of our other cohorts, um, including minority religious groups and socio-economic background. In light of everything that is said, um, and in light of all of the speakers, um, we will be supporting this motion, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alderman McMorris. Um, I don't have any further speakers, so I'm going to go back to Councillor Sinoi Bar. To sum up. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to all the members who have spoken on this motion. 
ideally I would have wanted a functioning executive to lead the way on this issue, but in its absence, it is vital that we explore all avenues to push this issue further up the agenda. And that is why I'm really keen that council officers engage with Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group to explore the visibility of introducing a pilot gender budget analysis scheme. The collection of gender desegregated data by council will be key to understanding how policies and budgets affect our constituents. And if we don't have the data, it is difficult to measure how effective our policies are. And I agree, capacity is also essential. Gender responsive budgeting makes for good governance across the board, and it is imperative that, and, that transparency and increases the effectiveness of policy. And in addition, the increasing gender equality and helping to realize women's rights. So thank you all for supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I believe there were some people who expressed concerns, and but nobody actually spoke against it. So I'm going to believe that that is also unanimous. Okay. Um, it's almost six o'clock, so there's no point in going on to the next motion at this point. Um, so we'll reconvene tomorrow at two o'clock, um, where the next motion up will be Councillor Jackson's. Okay. Thank you.